Uh, when we talk about the healthcare crisis in America, uh, I'm afraid that far too often we ignore uh, a very important aspect of that crisis. And that is the tens of millions of Americans are either unable to afford or unable to access the kind of dental care that they need. As a result, there is widespread suffering throughout the country that largely goes unseen. This is an issue really that is not talked about anywhere near enough. And I have uh, distributed for the members of the committee uh, just a number of statements that we assembled from all over the country. We did a, sent out an email in Vermont, which as you know is a very small state. We got 500 people, 500 people, who talked about the cost of dental care or their inability to access uh, dentists. Uh, and we got 1,000, I think, nationwide. So this is an issue I think that's on people's mind and I think it's an issue uh, worthy of serious discussion here. Uh, Today in America, nearly 70 million adults and nearly 8 million children have no dental insurance, and many of those who do have dental insurance find that coverage to be totally inadequate. In fact, nearly half of Americans who have dental insurance have skipped their appointments because they could not afford to pay for the dental procedures they need. And I hope one of the issues that the panel will talk about today is why dental care is so very expensive. You know, people walk into a dental office and they find that they got a huge bill and paying off for years. Maybe we can discuss that. Uh, nearly one out of five seniors in America have lost all of their natural teeth. And many of them cannot afford dentures, which can cost many thousands of dollars. Seventy percent of older Americans have some sort of periodontal, periodontal disease, which can lead to rheumatoid arthritis and cardiovascular disease. Uh, but it's not obviously just seniors who are hurting here. More than 40% of children in America have tooth decay by the time they reached kindergarten, primarily because their parents could either not afford or could not find a dentist on time. Lack of affordable dental care in America is a problem all over our country, but it is especially acute for lower income Americans, pregnant women, people with disabilities, veterans, those who live in rural communities, and black, Latino, and Native Americans. The situation has become so absurd, and this is really quite remarkable, and I think we'll hear a little bit of this today, uh, that every year, hundreds of thousands of Americans leave the United States, go to countries like Mexico, Costa Rica, India, Thailand, and Hungary, where it is much less expensive to get the dental care they need, and it's even cheaper after paying all of your transportation costs we should be thinking about why that's happening in America. Uh, and the reason is not difficult to understand. The price of a dental implant in our country can cost about 5,500, compared to around uh, $850 in Mexico, 800 in Costa Rica, and $450 in India, the same treatment. The average price of a root canal in America can cost $1,275, compared to less than 250 in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Over the past week, as I mentioned, my office uh, sent out a request. Tell me, how are you dealing with dental care? And the response we got was just overwhelming. Um, uh, and, and responses that we got kind of, you would not think would be taking place in the richest country in the world. Uh, we can understand if we were living in some very poor country, but that's not the case. Um, if people, as I think everybody knows in the medical profession, if people don't receive high quality dental care, they are in danger of living their lives uh, with severe pain. Uh, we need to understand that a major cause of absenteeism, interestingly enough, from school, is a result of toothache and dental pain. Uh, we need to understand that when nearly half of adults in America have some sort of periodontal disease, it makes them two or three times more likely uh, to have a heart attack, stroke, or some other serious cardiovascular emergency. Uh, we need to understand that when your teeth are in bad shape and you cannot chew your food properly, you're in greater risk of diabetes, digestive problems, and poor birth outcomes, and there's something else that we don't talk about that is not just health. When we see people without any teeth in their mouth, that is a symbol that they are poor. Walk in, try to get a job without any teeth in your mouth. Good luck to you, because you're not gonna get it. Uh, we've got to understand that if we're going to seriously address the dental crisis in America, Congress is going to have to act 
and act boldly. And that's why I've introduced today uh, what I believe is the most comprehensive piece of dental care legislation uh, that we have ever seen in our country. And what this legislation does, it would have substantially expand the number of dentists. When we talk about a workforce crisis in healthcare, not just doctors, not just nurses, it is dentists. And we need to talk about that. But dental hygienists and dental therapists in America, particularly in rural and underserved areas, and I trust we'll be discussing this with the panel. Uh, it is unacceptable to me that 67% of rural communities in America are designated as dental professional shortage areas. Uh, furthermore, uh, we need to make sure, and this is a major problem I hope we discuss as well, you can have a dentist, many dentists no longer treat uh, lower income people who are on Medicaid. And I know that in the southern part of my state, it is acute. I'm told that kids in the southern part of my state are having a hard time finding a dentist. And Vermont generally does better than many other states in these areas. Uh, it is unacceptable to me that only a third of our nation's dentists provide care to people who are on Medicaid. And that's a problem we gotta deal with. Um, third, we've got to substantially expand high quality and comprehensive dental insurance in America. Uh, many of our seniors do not have a comprehensive dental insurance because traditional Medicare does not cover most dental procedures. And for years, you know, I have talked about and I hope we will be able to expand Medicare to cover dental, vision, uh, and hearing as well. Um, Veterans, we have a VA system which by and large provides good health care to its people, but for whatever reason, dental is not part of that, and I hope that we can expand that, and our legislation does that. It expands uh, dental care in federally qualified health centers who do a great job but are understaffed uh, in terms of the dentists that they have. All right, bottom line is uh, this is an issue that we do not discuss enough. It is a crisis issue, uh, and I hope that today we're going to take this issue a major step forward, and I thank the panelists very much for being with us. Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chairman Sanders. Um, I'm glad we're focusing on quality dental health care. The health committee has examined health workforce shortages, and so hopefully we can pass this, we can pass, come out of this with legislation that can pass, that can address issues in the dental field. Uh, now, by the way, passing legislation takes bipartisan support, um, and I would, ask just one more time, encourage greater participation between the majority and the minority. If everybody representing all the Americans we represent, both Republicans and Democrats, come together and are heard, we're more likely to get something which can actually be signed into law. That's why I've said repeatedly, asking the majority to engage the minority in preparation and crafting of these hearings. If we want hearings to be a springboard for passing legislation, we must lay that groundwork together. But I also have to note that there are other urgent issues impacting the lives of our constituents. I requested for months that we hold hearings on the disturbing anti-Semitism spreading on college campuses. Jewish students are being threatened and assaulted. No student should be afraid while attending school or be a victim of bigotry. But there's not been a commitment from the majority that we will exercise oversight over this response or the lack of a response from universities and the Department of Education. We could also hold a hearing on the Biden administration's repeated blunders in rolling out the new free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA application. Some students may forego college because without financial aid offers, they don't know if they can afford. But the incompetent Biden administration bureaucrats who bungled the rollout are not facing any consequences, even though students are. These issues should be bipartisan. We should have Secretary Cardona before this committee to examine him and their response. We have the time. For example, last week we didn't even have a hearing. In fact, we are a year and a half into this Congress and we've not had a single hearing on the state of primary or secondary education, which is we are the Health Education Labor and Pension Committee. I'll stop there because I don't want to take away from discussing dental care. Um, you know, I helped found a public private partnership providing free dental and health care to the working uninsured in my uh, area in, in kind of the capital region of Louisiana. I found out that the pent-up demand for dental care is greater than the pent-up demand for medical care. The uninsured can go to the emergency room, but they can get it and then get a tooth pulled there. 
but they can't get anything else done. Dr. Isbell's kind of shaking his head like he doesn't want that pulled in the emergency room. I get that. Uh, but, but, but as a rule, uh, the pent-up demand is greater for dental. That said, recent data shows that 88% of Americans have dental coverage. Now, despite this, some call for mandating dental coverage under Medicare and Medicaid. Right now, uh, under Medicare, approximately 98% of Medicare Advantage plans offer dental benefits, and more than half of Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in an MA plan. Um, that's pretty significant. And in addition, states have the option to provide dental coverage to adult Medicaid enrollees. As Senator Sanders notes, or at least um, um, uh, implies, reimbursement rate under Medicaid is so lousy that, frankly, it's the illusion of coverage without the power of access. If you're losing money on every patient you see who's covered by Medicaid, you can't make it up with volume. Uh, and that is, and I, now I see Dr. Swan agreeing with that, that is just a reality. Uh, I'll note that a lot of independent medical practices are, are struggling to provide quality care with low reimbursement rates and the administrative burden that comes with a federal mandate. And some are selling their practice or the doc is retiring. I'm afraid that mandating dental coverage might be similarly harmful. Um, and with Medicare on track for insolvency in a little over a decade, we should also think about making that sustainable before adding programs to it. Now, looking at the commercial market, the vast majority of patients in employer-sponsored plans have the option of dental coverage. And among employers offering health benefits in 2023, uh, about 90 to 94 percent of them offer dental insurance. And of course, that allows the patient to get the option that serves their need best. So many of these individuals currently get dental coverage through a standalone dental plan. And while major medical plans can offer dental benefits, standalone benefits often give the also have lower uh, deductibles along with the lower overall medical deductible. However, this year, the Biden administration issued regulations allowing states to require ACA plans, ACA plans to provide dental coverage doesn't kick in until 2027, but it will raise premiums in these already expensive and often unaffordable plans, or it will increase the subsidy that taxpayers are paying, which means the cost of the bill is stuck on all of us. Now, it's important to note um, that dental care workforce is also an issue, and that's particularly true in rural and underserved areas and also urban areas. Senator Budd is the lead sponsor of the Action for Dental Health Act, which reauthorizes a grant program through the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, helping states because increase their oral health workforce and provide dental care, particularly in those underserved communities. I worked on this before be, being ranking member and uh, just understand the importance. The Health Committee has dedicated four hearings to examine health workforce shortages and two markups this Congress. We've examined critical programs supporting dental workforce, including the National Health Services Corps. It's important that we get a long-term reauthorization signed into law. We also need to understand that with dentists, we often don't have a supply problem, but a distribution problem. My dentists tell me that you know, there are certain cities we'll work in, but the rural areas, it's more difficult to support. Um, this year, it shows that we have 98 to 99% of the dentists and oral surgeons we need, but again, the rural areas, it's only 63% uh, of the general dentists and 44% of the oral surgeons. So impacting the supply and distribution of dental providers is crucial before directing a solution. One way to address workforce shortages, our work to address workforce shortages should continue to be at top of the mind for the committee as there will be additional reauthorizations. This includes the Title VII programs of the Public Health Services Act, which contains a number of important programs bolstering dental workforce and access to care. I look forward to the testimony and learning more how we can responsibly improve dental care for all Americans. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Um, our first witness is Dr. Lisa Simon, a dentist and physician, both. Uh, who provides primary care to underserved communities in the Boston area. Her research focuses on the role of oral health and overall health and well-being and the impact of federal and state policy on oral health success uh, and access. Dr. Simon is also a member of the faculty at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Simon, thanks so much for being with us. 
Thank you so much, Senator Sanders, for having me here today, and thank you, Ranking Member Cassidy. Uh, I'm honored to speak with you both today about oral health in our country. Senator Sanders is a tireless advocate for the marginalized, and Senator Cassidy is a fellow physician. I am deeply grateful to both of you for helping shine a light on this invisible form of suffering. I speak in support of Senator Sanders' Comprehensive Dental Reform Act. Practicing as a dentist in a community health center broke my heart. The wait for my services routinely exceeded four months, and I was often forced to extract teeth that I could have saved because of insufficient Medicaid funding. I will never forget the young woman my own age whose front teeth were so badly decayed that they all needed to be removed. This remarkable young mother gave me a gift that she could barely afford to thank me for trying to save them, even though she was left with a smile that would make it more difficult for her to eat, speak, or find work. It was patients like her who inspired me to enter medical school and work on the crisis in oral health from both sides of the aisle. Through medical school, I practiced dentistry at the Suffolk County Jail, where I had multiple patients tell me that the only good thing to happen to them since they had become incarcerated was that they finally got to see a dentist. Now as an internal medicine physician, I see even more unmet dental need than I did practicing dentistry because I see the patients who never make it to a dental office. I have cared for patients in the intensive care unit with life-threatening sepsis from a dental infection. I have met patients who cannot start chemotherapy because they can't afford to remove their infected teeth. I have met patients with nutrient deficiencies from ill-fitting dentures. And I have met patients who, even knowing that I am a doctor and a dentist, are so ashamed of their teeth that they won't let me look in their mouths. My patient suffering is not quantifiable but their experiences are part of the $22 billion a year that CMS spends on dental care, a cost that could be much better spent ensuring access to comprehensive and preventive services and not on the devastating downstream effects of unmet need. I wish to highlight the following policies that could dramatically improve oral health in the US. First, make adult dental coverage a mandatory Medicaid benefit. Dental benefits for adults are currently determined at the state level and benefits range from comprehensive to non-existent. These benefits are persistently threatened in times of budget shortfall due to their optional nature, even though data confirms that Medicaid dental coverage can increase access to jobs for beneficiaries, to say nothing of decreasing preventable suffering. Next, Medicare must cover dental care. The 1965 Social Security Act statutory exclusion of dental care must be reversed. Fewer than half of Medicare beneficiaries see a dentist each year. When they do, they spend more than $1,000 out of pocket on their care. My research has shown that enrolling in Medicare is associated with a five percentage point jump in toothlessness. The new limited dental benefit, for which only a very few beneficiaries will be eligible, is momentous, but it is a drop in the bucket. A truly comprehensive Medicare dental plan has been estimated by the Congressional Budget Office to cost CMS less each year than the single Alzheimer's medication Aduhelm. And this does not include the cost savings of offering preventive care that keeps people healthy. Dental plans are often a draw for beneficiaries to choose Medicare Advantage. But my research has found that beneficiaries with Medicare Advantage have rates of dental access that are just as low and out-of-pocket costs that are just as high as traditional Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare Advantage is not the solution here. Lastly, we must make the evolution of dental care a national priority. Dental therapists, a provider equivalent to a physician assistant or nurse practitioner, can expand the dental team and bring care to communities failed by the current system. CMS must increase its oral health infrastructure and resources in order to lead policy innovation. And we need better NIH funding to uncover the causative links between oral health and overall health, and how our policies affect both health and healthcare economics. I should note that much of organized dentistry has repeatedly lobbied against these policies, dating back to 1965. This defends the status quo of small business owners and not the oral health of patients and communities. But it does not speak for all dentists. Yet dentistry has been unable or unwilling to change itself to serve the needs of more Americans. Both my medical and dental patients ask me the same question. Why is it so hard for me to get dental care? There is no good reason. There is no good reason why we live in a country where low-income Americans are 16 times more likely to lose all of their teeth than their wealthy neighbors. It simply isn't fair. My patients deserve better. Our country deserves better. Thank you for helping us achieve it. Dr. Simon, thank you very much. Uh, our next witness, witness is Dr. Maisha Minta-Jordan, 
the president and CEO of the CareQuest Institute for Oral Health in Boston. Dr. Mitten Jordan is a physician and researcher and leads a team to improve the oral health of all through research, health improvement programs, policy, and education. Uh, Dr. Mitten Jordan, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing on a critical issue that deserves urgent action. It is encouraging that policymakers like yourselves are increasingly looking for ways to improve oral health policy. We are particularly grateful to you, Senator Sanders, for your leadership in reintroduction of the Comprehensive Dental Reform Act. And thank you, Senator Cassidy. Greater Baton Rouge Community Clinic is a critical access point for oral health care. My name is Dr. Maisha Minter Jordan. I am the president and CEO of the CareQuest Institute for Oral Health. Our mission is to create a more equitable, accessible, and integrated health system for everyone. I'm here today to share my expertise as a physician and community leader dedicated to improving health care for all people. I am an internist and previously served as chief medical officer and CEO of the Demick Center, one of the largest community health centers in Massachusetts. It was during my time at the Demick Center that I truly understood the impact of oral disease on people's lives. The severity of oral disease that several of our Head Start children experienced meant that children as young as three years old were put under anesthesia in order to remove decay and repair and stop the progression of their oral health disease. Oral health is so much more than a nice smile. It has far-reaching impacts on overall health. Hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and adverse birth outcomes all have a direct correlation to oral health. Dental disease can also threaten family financial stability, as well as state and federal health care budgets. It can keep children home from school and adults from being able to work. It can cause pain so severe that people cannot eat or conduct their routine activities of daily living. In fact, lost work productivity time due to untreated dental disease costs the U.S. an estimated $45 billion each year. Yet, oral health remains siloed from the rest of the healthcare system. Millions of people cannot access the oral health care that they need, most often because they cannot afford it. Delays in care likely cost the system far more than a routine preventative visit would have. Dental care is the number one medical service skipped due to cost, even more than prescription drugs. Nearly 70 million adults in the United States do not have dental insurance. Medicare does not cover routine dental care, leaving half of Medicare enrollees, nearly 25 million older Americans and people with disabilities, without dental benefits. There is currently no financial support for adults to purchase dental insurance through the health insurance marketplace. And adult dental coverage is optional under state Medicaid programs, which means that coverage varies widely from extensive benefits to none at all. Dental coverage gaps have exacerbated a nationwide oral health crisis that forces many people to forego critical dental care. CareQuest Institute for Oral Health conducts an annual nationally representative survey on consumer access to, experience with, and knowledge about health care. Our findings continue to show that the, this crisis is widespread and disproportionately impacts low-income individuals, people in rural communities, and racial and ethnic minorities. For example, adults with lower incomes are significantly more likely than those with higher incomes to report costs as a barrier to seeing a dentist in the last two years. 34% of individuals living in a rural environment rate their oral health as fair or poor, which is about 10% higher than for people in urban and suburban areas. And black adults are 68% more likely to have an unmet dental need than white adults. Prevalence of early childhood tooth decay in American Indian and Alaskan Native communities is three times higher than it is for white children. Progress is being made. Private and public payers are increasingly recognizing the positive impact on overall health outcomes and reduction in the total cost of care that routine oral health care can offer. Addressing coverage gaps is a foundational step toward a more integrated system that allows us to invest in prevention, bolster the oral health workforce, and improve the exchange of health information between medical and dental providers. Integration not only improves the care experience, it reduces cost. For instance, CareQuest Institute research shows that healthcare costs for adults with diabetes could be $3,000 less each year if they get periodontal treatment. Think about how much that would save if the nearly 40 million people in this country with diabetes all had access to integrated care that includes dental. We have the model. Look at the integration we achieve in many of our nation's community health centers and the progress we have made with primary care and behavioral health. It is time to bring that to oral health. 
the data continues to tell an unacceptable story, not only in terms of the impact on oral health status, but also on overall health outcomes. It is time to change this story. It is up to all of us, the policymakers in this room, providers, educators, and advocates, to create a more accessible, equitable, and integrated healthcare system. Thank you for having me here today. It is an honor. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony and your work. Uh, our next witness is Dr. Brian Jeffrey Swan, a dentist who serves on the board of directors of Remote Area Medical, a volunteer organization that provides pop-up medical clinics around the United States offering dental, vision, and general medical care at no cost to patients. Dr. Swan is also co-chair of the Global Oral Health Outreach at the National Dental Association. Uh, Dr. Swan, thanks a lot for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Chairman Sanders and Ranking Member, Dr. Bill Cassidy. It's a pleasure to be here with the HELP Committee. My or if you could talk a little bit louder, that would be. Let's move this over here. My name is Brian Swan. I'm testifying today as a former private and now public health trained oral physician practicing in Tennessee, North Carolina, and Massachusetts. My primary residence is East Tennessee in a small town called Greenback, not far from where I was born. When I was seven years old, my family moved to California. Starting as a cleaning lady uh, for affluent white families, my mother eventually enrolled and completed dental assisting courses. At age 12, I had my first dental visit with my mother's employee, the only black dentist in the area. He diagnosed me with 13 cavities, all in need of intervention. I often ponder my complex pathway to oral health care and the sometimes torturous or frankly impossible path many in this country are faced to navigate in search of dental care. Today I serve on the board of the Remote Area of Medicine, RAM, as well as co-chair of the Committee on Global Health and Outreach for the National Dental Association. RAM is a major nonprofit provider uh, for uh, these pop-up medical clinics, and the mission is to prevent pain and alleviate suffering by providing free dental vision, medical, uh, and, uh, uh, and dental services to underserved and uninsured individuals. RAM's core is more than 200,000 humanitarian volunteers, along with licensed dentists, vision, and medical professionals, have treated more than 900,000 individuals and delivered more than $200 million worth of healthcare services. Today, RAM is nearing its 1400th clinic. It also partners with organizations striving to make a positive change regarding access to care. One of these organizations RAM partners with is the National Dental Association, whose mission is to serve marginalized and oppressed communities and also was the Dental Association in 1965 that argued that Medicare should include dental care. The people that come to RAM for assistance often drive across two or three state lines, sleeping in their cars, wrapped in blankets to stay warm. Many people uh, come days before the clinic just to ensure that they get a ticket. Patients suffer from cavities, from gum disease, and this is concerning due to the interplay of gum disease and diabetes. Nowhere can the necessity of RAM be more seen than the story of Jade, who I've had permission from her mother to talk about her case. She was a 27-year-old Appalachian woman with a history of type 1 diabetes that led to placement of a port after two-thirds of her right lung had been removed. She developed swelling called cellulitis under her chin and neck region from a decayed, infected lower molar. Due to the swelling and pain, lack of dental home, she did what many patients do, and that was to visit the emergency department, the local hospital. She was given antibiotics and pain medication in the form of pills and took uh, 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 to seek dental care. She went uh, to see the local dentist who had recently extracted all of her mom's teeth and was told that $900 was the cost to remove this one offending tooth. Not having the cash, she decided to wait and anticipated a refund check. The following month, Swelling had advanced, and she was prescribed more of the same medications, which is an antibiotic and opioid, uh, which alleviated symptoms but not treat the problem. In the third month, she contracted COVID, which impaired her breathing even more. She was given yet more antibiotics and pain medication, which she could no longer swallow. The following month, she returned to the hospital uh, available for uh, unable to swallow. Her, ne her neck had turned black, 
the doctors immediately put her in an ambulance and rushed her to a nearby university hospital only 35 minutes away, where she was given uh, antibiotics through an IV uh, and the tooth was removed. Sadly, two days later, she died. The cause of death was listed as sepsis from an infected tooth derived from a condition called Ludwig's angina. As this as, as is typical in the US medical schools, the hospital doctors had not received even limited training in oral health, which may have contributed to Jade's death. Her mother and her husband of one year, who are now in therapy, proclaimed, if they had only told us that a tooth infection could kill my daughter. There is need to bring attention to the social determinants of health and begin the process of educating not only patients, but the community and all professionals on what is needed for sustainability and longevity of our oral uh, and systemic health. RAM presents an immediate short-term solution to a long-term problem. Prevention, education, high percentage of our patients have low health IQ, not understanding what's happening to the oral cavity and how it's connected uh, and contributes to what's happening in the rest of the body. Specific dental education should be provided to patients uh, during all touch points, enhanced through digitization as well. We need to increase the number of states who provide non-emergency adult uh, Medicaid services, which usually is medication and or an extraction. And the, uh, the logistics for that needs to come from more dental associations, not only the ADA. RAM is also concerned about temporary state licenses for volunteer work, which would apply to dentists, hygienists, and assistants. This would resolve the dearth of state licensed health care providers and open the doors to health care providers licensed in other states to volunteer provide care at RAM events. Uh, I went to the dental field uh, inspired by my mother over the years working with RAM and the NDA. I have seen personally uh, the human connection. When a human being comes into these clinics for treatment, most often to escape pain and discomfort, and is treated with respect uh, in the process, immense gratitude is felt, but not just for the patient, for everyone involved. We all receive a blessing in this exchange, and this is work. The history can be made today, but there needs to be a shift. Dr. Swan, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cassidy, you want to introduce uh, the next panelist? I will allow Senator Tuberville to. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. You know, it's my honor today to introduce uh, Dr. Gordon Isabel from Gadsden, Alabama. Dr. Isabel went to Auburn University for his bachelor's degree and then to UAB for his degree in dental medicine. And since 1981, he's been serving the people of Gadsden area through his practice, Isabel Dental. Over the years, Dr. Isabel has been very active with, a degree, with the Academy of General Dentistry, and he served in a variety of leadership roles with the organization both at the state and national level. He was also president of the Alabama Dental Association from 2017 to 2018. Dr. Isabel has had a distinguished career full of honors and awards from entities across the state of Alabama and across the country. He spent years, years advocating for dentists, their patients, and their communities. And he's managed to accomplish this all while raising five children with his wife, Cindy, who is, by the way, an Alabama graduate. Uh, today, Dr. Isabel will bring an important perspective to this hearing in that of practicing dentists in a community and state with many wide-ranging health care challenges. Dr. Isabel provides charitable care to his community through his involvement with donated dental services, mission of mercies and regional access mission programs. He will speak to the efforts of private dentists uh, across the country and their efforts to reach underserved populations. Dr. Isabel, thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator Tuberville. Should that so I got me there? Okay, thank you, Senator Tuberville. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Academy of General Dentistry. The AGD is the only professional association that exclusively represents general dentists. The nation is paying more attention to oral health care. Research continues to highlight the importance of dental care overall well-being, but also shows the inequities in access. The AGD is committed to addressing these inequities by leveraging the abilities of private practice general dentists. 
we must protect private practice dentistry and ensure the longevity and resilience of the dental profession by supporting fully trained and licensed dentists in comprehensive services only they can provide. I am Dr. Gordon Isbell III, and I've practiced general dentistry for 43 years. My son and I practice together. My practice cares for many underserved populations. It is a true honor to serve so many of our veterans when they have difficulty receiving care. I have a daughter with spinal muscular atrophy and understand the barriers that patients with disabilities face. She lives her life in an electric wheelchair. It is up to the provider community to come together to help. Research estimates over 100 systemic diseases have oral manifestations. Illnesses related to oral health result in 6.1 million days of bed disability, 12.7 million days of restricted activity, and 20.5 million lost work days each year. Most oral health conditions are avoidable through oral health literacy, sound hygiene, and preventative care. Private practice dentists can detect and treat oral health problems as early as possible, avoiding expensive emergency room visits and complications that may rise from subsequent medical conditions. Yet we are challenged with increased governmental paperwork and regulations. Reimbursements have continually decreased as the cost of doing business has escalated, making it challenging for individual practitioners to provide care. Workforce shortages uh, remain a significant challenge. All six of the hygienists in our practice are near retirement age, but I'm here to talk about solutions. Foremost, AGD cares deeply about ensuring every American has access to oral health care and strives to ensure governmental policies are properly targeted for optimal effectiveness. While the AGD supports federal programs that increase access to care, and address disparities, it is important these programs fill the gaps that truly exist. We have written to HHS that the data used to calculate health professional shortage areas may be out of date, resulting in inaccurate information. Increasing governmental services and locations already being served by private practice can harm small independent dentists. We must also address workforce strains. The AGD strongly supports the reauthorization of the Action for Dental Health, which provides critical state grants to support dental health workforce initiatives in areas with shortages. We also support Title VII, which administers grants to bolster postdoctoral dental programs, advanced dental education, and offer loan repayments for dentists. Such grants play a pivotal role in addressing the scarcity of dental school professors and also diversity within our dental field. Our members feel the dental insurance industry forces independent dentists into unfair contracts. The AGD urges Congress to pass the DOC Act, which would prohibit dental insurers from requiring providers to charge patients a mandated fee for non-covered services. Over 40 states uh, prohibit this practice. The AGD sincerely thanks the committee, especially Senator Collins, for her efforts to include AGD as an improved provider of continued education for prescribers of opioids in the reauthorization of the Support Act. The AGD also appreciates Senator Lujan and uh, Senator Collins' efforts on Oral Health Literacy and Awareness Act. In, in conclusion, advancing access to the delivery of oral health care to all will require swift intentional action. Progress will require partnership, and we urge your support for policies that prioritize oral health well-being in conjunction with the dental profession, including private independent practices. The AGD strongly believes every person deserves a dental home and access to routine, safe, reliable, quality oral health care provided by trained and licensed professionals led by dentists. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today, and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Isabel, thank you very much for your testimony and for your work. I think every one of the panelists has indicated that we have a serious dental crisis in America. You've all made the connection between dental health and physical health. So let me start off with a simple question. Uh, in the richest country in the history of the world, 
why are we experiencing the kind of dental crisis that we have where tens and tens of millions of people can't afford to go to a dentist, can't find a dentist, or if they do find a dentist, there are waiting lists for six months or a year. Uh, that's the crisis. How do we solve it, Dr. Simon? Dentistry has been separate from medicine since the first dental school was founded in Maryland in the 1840s. And since then, the separation of medicine and dentistry has spun off and continued to cause problems by the way it's upheld within our insurance structures, our education system, and the ways healthcare is delivered. When things are separate, it makes it harder to get through a second door. Americans already struggle to get healthcare in the first place. If we make it that they have to walk through one door and get to a smaller locked one, they are going to have a hard time so moving in. So bottom line is dental care is health care should be available to all as a right. Is dental right? care is health care and health care is a human okay. right. Uh, Dr. Jordan, what's your thoughts? I think there's been a lack of recognition of the cost savings that, would, uh, that we could have if we were able to integrate uh, oral health and medical and certainly agree with Dr. Simon. We know again that periodontal treatment for people with diabetes has been shown to reduce overall health costs. And Medicare, we know that there's a potential to save up to $14 billion annually by providing appropriate oral health care with people with diabetes. With heart disease, we could save almost $30 million. Let me jump in. We've heard this story a thousand times. That's correct. That, what did you say, Senator Cassidy? An ounce of prevention? We, all right. we hear this over and over again. We're pretty good mm -hmm. at spending zillions of dollars treating people who are on death's door, but we don't prevent the cavities that little kids have. That's right. Dr. Swan? Well, I agree with the microphone, please. With the, with the prevention issue, we also start looking at the fact that we have to train across disciplines. Everybody should know what the risk factors are. There should be no entity that's not advocating for healthy uh, societies. So we need to put our money where our mouth is. Dr. Isbell? You know, Senator, all I can tell you is what we do in our world. You know, we, we have free clinics in our practice and have for many years, and now we have a free clinic in our town. We work with RAM, and I applaud uh, Dr. Swan for his RAM program. We were there to take care of our people. I'll tell you about a, a student that uh, came, was going to nursing school. All of her front teeth were rotted out. She came and was concerned and whatever. So we, we rebuilt her mouth. We did it. She went to nursing school and a successful practitioner today. We did it for, for her, for nothing. That's you know, and dentists do that all over the country. And you're not telling that story, Senator, because there are dentists that are out there that are helping people. And there is there more? There's always more. Uh, I'm saying, but, Doctor, there certainly are, and I thank you very much for what you do. And many dentists do it. We have a crisis. Millions of people cannot find a dentist, cannot afford dental care. I don't think that that is uh, under debate. I think that's the reality. Let me ask all of you another question. And I was kind of shocked to learn this a few years ago. I talked to dentists who have graduated dental school, three, four $400,000 in debt. So we talk about not getting dentists out into rural areas, lower income areas, it's hard to make money in lower income areas. What does the cost of dental school and dental school debt have impact uh, where dentists go? Dr. Simon? The average dental school graduate graduates with more, almost $100,000 more debt than the average medical school graduate, around $300,000, as you say. I think it absolutely influences where they practice. Okay. Um, yeah, Dr. I mean, I would agree with Dr. Simon. There is a, there's a crisis as to how we can afford education and the impact of the cost of education on the choices that professionals make when they go to provide care. It certainly impacts dentists and their ability to accept patients with Medicaid because of the low reimbursement rates, as well as the multifactorial costs that are inherent in having a dental practice. So part of what we have to address is the use of ancillary providers as well as a means of expanding access to care. Dr. Swan? I agree with the statements that have been made. NYU's tuition right now for four years is $700,000, where the <coughs> medical school tuition is zero because of some donation. So we see these students getting out. I have talked with a young doctor who's been practicing seven years. He's got $600,000 in debt. He's frustrated, he doesn't know what to do. He can barely make it. So I think that's one issue. Another issue is putting more emphasis on reimbursement rates, especially around prevention. Dr. Isbell? Yes, I, I agree with that statement too. It's, it's scary. The average 
Right now they say it's 262,000, but I know many students with much higher than that. So it's a, it's a challenging situation. Then where do they go? You know, the big deal is to, to give them an opportunity into residencies. And if we could have some form, and there's legislation in front of you to possibly, if there could be just a halt on it. They're not asking for forgiveness. They're asking for just to be able to go to residency and train where they can have access to care and treat patients. And then really, if we could develop programs to get our dentists into rural areas, I know in our state that's something we've worked hard at and we're having some success, but getting students from the beginning that are planning to go back into the rural areas to take, because our citizens deserve that, Senator. Well, let, let me just, uh, my time has expired, but just, I, I would also think, not only if I graduated medical school, a dental school with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, that's one thing, but if I'm a young person, a working class kid, thinking about going into dental school, do I really want to go into a profession? We're gonna end up with three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in debt. I suspect that's a deterrent for a lot of young people going to med uh, dental school, is that right? That, I'm seeing Very. heads being nodded here. Okay, that my time has expired. Senator Cassidy. Hey, thank you all for being here. Uh, Dr. Isbell, I, um, by the way, I'm also married to an Alabama grad, which uh, I rarely <laughs> mention on the campaign trail, being from Louisiana, so I'll just point that out. <laughs> um, she was a couple years after you at UAB. Um, the, um, I would just have my teeth done, and Senator Sanders talks about the expense. He just touched on the cost of tuition, but I was amazed at the technology in a dental office. They don't put the little x-rays up as they did when I was a child, it's all digitalized. And I can imagine it's fairly expensive. I also understand it's a highly regulated industry. We want to make sure it's sanitary, but there's a cost of compliance. And then as you mentioned, there's workforce shortage, which I presume that you pay the hygienist more. Uh, that hygienist was out that day, so I had the dentist's wife taking care of me, which uh, we had a great conversation. So all that to say, like, what percent of a typical dentist uh, practice goes to overhead, and then if they're just out, and Dr. Swan, you can answer this too, please, uh, what percent of their income would be dedicated towards paying back student loans? That's a good question, Senator. Um, you know, o overhead has increased exponentially over the last 43 years. Uh, the cost of having quality individuals. Uh, for my patients of all income levels, uh, which we treat the very poorest to the people that do better, uh, I want them to be able to understand the care they need. So we have interoral cameras, we have monitors to be able to show them what's there to where they can make choices to have quality health care. Every individual. And what, what percent of your, uh, like, like a dentist back home told me that like 60% of his, uh, he's got a 60% overhead. I think it's higher than that. I'd say 70% at this time. Is that, would that include the student loan payments to go back? It does not. Uh, so so it would be even higher. Dr. Swan, would you kind of agree with that? Totally agree with that. Uh, it does not include student loan payments. And pe people just getting out of school, it's going to take them five to seven years before they start breaking even in business. I've never been to a dentist in Mexico, but I can imagine they might still have those little x-rays and not the digital that we've become familiar with. Uh, I just say that because there is a quality of care that you two provide, which is quite remarkable. Um, let me move on. Uh, Dr. Swan, if 100% of an average patient, of 100% of an average dentist payer mix was at Medicaid rates, could that dentist stay in business? Most likely not, but that dentist could mix it. I get that, so it's payer mix. Mm -hmm. Dr. Isabel, you're actually in practice, and Alabama's like Louisiana. You've got a lot of poor folk. We do. Um, do you see pediatrics? We do. We so, so you got some Medicaid patients in there. We don't. Uh, you don't. If you, if you had 100% of Medicaid, I'm suspecting that you could not keep your doors open. We could not. Now, I, I point out, Dr. S uh, Senator, I just, I, I don't know if I demoted you or elevated you. Uh, I was about to say Dr. Sanders. Um, <laughs> Senator, S <laughs> oh, yeah. Senator Sanders uh, sometimes refers to being poorly insured, but that's a euphemism for Medicaid. I was just in California, and there's a hospital going out of business, they think, because they got so many Medi-Cal patients, and Medi-Cal pays so poorly. Um, so I, I just want to point out that whenever we talk about mandating uh, through Medicaid, if you mandate the dentist to see the patient, 
then you are going to end up with bankrupt dentists. The other thing I've been told by private dentists, the, the section of Baton Rouge, uh, principally African American, has African American African American dentist, and my, my and they don't tell me this, but my colleagues do. My 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 um, the folks that were my colleagues in our free clinic for the working uninsured, that when a community health center brought in dental services, they put those two dentists out of business, because they could they basically had their practice underwritten by the CHC, and they get a they get a higher Medicaid rate, they get 1.5 times, and so. So the, these guys were saying, we just lost two dentists in a bad section, in a poor section of town, bad, bad, bad dental care, bad um, um, uh, dental health care. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, and and so is that a perverse effect of the CHC? I'm not criticizing the CHC. I'm just kind of pointing that out. What I've observed, Dr. Swan, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily a general reverse effect. I think that's an isolated issue. What I do feel in my practice, when I was doing private practice, I looked at the demographics. 25% of the population was on Denicam. So I accepted that. We were able to make ends meet. But it also meant building social... So you must have had another mix. You had a, a better off patient with commercial insurance or able to pay private dollars. We had a mix. In order, because I'm suspecting your dental cow was paying you below cost. Right. Okay. And, and Dr. Isbell? Yeah, you know, really in in that particular situation, you know, in our community, our it's called Quality of Health, our community health center. And for 40 years, I've worked with the dentists there. They've worked with our societies, and it's really been a collegial situation. It's been wonderful for the citizens of our community. And we've also, then they've and the dentists there have been helpful in our free clinic that we've started also, and also building the community uh, college programs and working on workforce with building dental assistants and hygienists there. So it can be there together, but I know other areas uh, of our state where it didn't work so well and there were dentists that it was unfair competition and they basically end up closing and moving. So it's important communication, just like for you guys, it's about communication, it's about sharing, but always, always putting your patient first and taking care of your patients. And I think the doctors here will agree with that. Thank you all. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Chair Sanders and ranking member for holding this hearing today. Um, and to our witnesses, I really appreciate uh, your testimony. Um, I want to sort of start where, uh, where uh, Dr. Cassidy left off with uh, a focus on community health uh, centers. Um, Dr. Simon, I think you said in your testimony that that's kind of where you first uh, started encountering some of the um, uh, some of the huge challenges that uh, we're discussing here today. And it seems to me in Wisconsin that, um, it, that the community health centers um, and their dental clinics are, um, are, are really stepping up and in uh, various communities really uh, uh, helping um, uh, create access that's affordable. Can you talk about your experience and the role that community health centers uh, uh, play in improving access to care for underserved populations. Certainly, and I'm proud to do so alongside two other former community health center uh, clinicians. Um, I think one thing that community health centers can do is uh, a matter of scale, which is that if you are a dental department within a health center that provides not only medical care, but pharmacy, all sorts of services, all of that administrative burden that Dr. Isbell mentions does not fall exclusively on the backs of a few dentists. It's something that's distributed. Um, and I think that that makes it much more satisfying and meaningful to practice dentistry because those sorts of concerns aren't ones that you need to deal with alone. On top of that, a federally qualified health center is required to have at least 50% of its boards composed of community members, which means that you are in direct service to the community and listening to your neighbors and the people that you are hoping to serve and following their lead. And I will say that usually their lead includes dental care. Uh, when it comes to the things we're able to do in a community health center, it is very dependent currently on what state Medicaid programs will cover. Um, and while there is some amount of free care or sliding scale care, it's almost always insufficient. On top of that, there are not enough community health centers and not enough community health center dentists. So the people who are trying to get in often can't. Uh, when I was training in internal medicine residency, my primary care clinic was at an FQHC in Boston. The entire time I trained there all three years, our dental clinic was never able to accept new patients. And none of my medical patients saw a dentist at our FQHC, even though the dental clinic was down the hall. Wow. Um, 
Dr. Minter Jordan, uh, you noted in your testimony uh, that matern maternal care and oral health are linked. Um, <coughs> when a mother has uh, poor oral health or can't access the dental care she needs, she and her child may face worse health outcomes. Um, and I know our country is currently facing a maternity care crisis. Yes. Um, what policies uh, would you recommend to improve maternal oral health care? Thank you for the question, Senator Baldwin. Uh, just as you've said, uh, we know that studies show that periodontal treatment for pregnant women can result in a nearly fourfold reduction in the rate of preterm delivery. We also know that between 60 and 75% of pregnant people experience oral health care issues that raise the likelihood of major complications and poor birth outcomes. One of the things that we did at the Community Health Center that I led in Boston, we led a centering, progress, centering pregnancy program that incorporated our dentists into the program to provide oral health care to pregnant mothers. Uh, so as from a policy perspective, it would be important for maternal health to be inclusive of oral health and to ensure that policies support mom getting access to oral health during her pregnancy and the education that goes along with that. Thank you. Um, in this conversation, it's important that we recognize that children must have access to dental care at a young age to ensure a healthy life. One way to improve access, which has uh, happened in my home state, is to provide school-based oral health prevention care. Dr. Simon, how does reaching people where they are um, with programs in schools or other community settings improve access and trust? As I mentioned to Senator Sanders, I think a lot about this in terms of making dentistry a separate door that's harder to get through. And what you're describing is eliminating that problem, uh, not only in schools, but for adults in nursing homes or uh, homes for people with developmental disabilities and inclusive of the pediatrician's or primary care physician's office. I give these talks a lot to my fellow primary care physicians and they are always so excited because right now what they feel is helpless. They, like me, are seeing dental patients and not able to do anything for them. So I think being expansive not only of our workforce, but also of the things we think about doing in various places are really important, just like what you described. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panelists. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to hear your opening statements but had an opportunity to look at the background. I want to I want to focus on on access to 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 um, oral health, dental care in rural areas because it's really hard. I grew up in a part of the state um, where if you needed to go to the dentist, you got in an airplane or you got on a ferry and uh, more often than not, you went to Seattle. And uh, that was not a cheap trip, but that was how we got our health care. We have improved dramatically since then, but we still have far too many communities where access is an issue. Um, so far as I know, you can't fill a cavity uh, through dental, uh, through telehealth. And so how we have been able to address this um, requires a little bit of thinking outside the box. The, the dental health aid therapist program, the DHAT program is something that we put in place in Alaska. We got a lot of pushback from the American Dental um, Association who thought that this was going to be encroaching on their territory and I said, you send me all the dentists that you want to come out to rural Alaska. And for more than just a couple week stint, because these kids don't, don't need health you know, dental care just one week or two weeks out of the year. We need somebody. And so we'll take a mid-level. We'll take somebody who will work with kids to encourage them on sim simple dental hygienics. And so we have made some good progress, but there is still so, so, so much more that we need to do to address access to, to dental care in our rural communities. Um, I think, Dr. Swan, you, have, you may have mentioned the DHAT program, but share with me, if you will, what more we can do, what more we must do in our more rural and remote areas because we're seeing health outcomes, overall health outcomes, that have been impacted negatively because it began with poor oral health care. Right. I agree with you. And I think that in the state of Alaska, you've been a prime example with a state that large and being able to get a program that is seeing people. And I read just last year 
in the 10 or 12 years you've had this program, there hasn't <laughs> been one malpractice lawsuit. That's right. So it's working. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to address that. Rural areas, we need more role models. In the schools of education where we're teaching young people to become doctors, they need to see people who are able to function and work in rural areas. Uh, and we don't see that necessarily in our faculty. There needs to be incentives, I think, that would help people. Uh, and just really innovative business models, uh, GPR programs, general practice residency programs, uh, those type of programs, I think, work like in the state of New York, where it's a requirement to get a license that you spend one year doing public work. I think that works, and I just think that uh, the rural communities would benefit from that. Other comments? Mm -hmm. Just to underscore, and thank you, Senator, Mur Senator Murkowski, for raising this, uh, just to underscore some of what you said. Our research shows that over uh, one-third of rural residents do not have dental insurance coverage. Four in 10 er uh, adults in, in rural areas have not seen a dentist in over a year, which is about 10% higher than suburban and urban areas. We also know that 67% of rural areas are health professional shortage areas. And so when I think about solutions, it is generally what Dr. Swan has said in terms of incentivizing providers, but also to your point, creating a, a greater opportunities for ancillary providers to provide services in rural areas and expanding the scope of practice in order to be able to do that. And one of the things that we, we see is a great disparity. Um, I'm talking about rural, but so many of our rural communities are predominantly Alaska Native. And so our Native population just suffers disproportionately when it comes to negative health outcomes related to, to dental health. So it's not an issue of insurance. I can tell you, I go around to the, to the um, small regional or sub-regional clinics, and we will have a dental chair. But it's practically brand spanking new, great equipment, because we can't get the providers that are out there. So everything that we can be doing to focus on training those who will will take on the, um, the, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, it's hard, it's not easy when you're moving around, when you really don't have the place to stay in these small communities. But it's an experience that ought to count for, um, for some level of of uh, support for the training. And I just, I would urge us all to think about how we fully connect all these dots. It's one thing to make it uh, available with the chairs and the equipment. It's another thing to get the providers that are out there, whether they are the dentists or the mid-levels like we have with the DHATs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Hassan. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair, and thanks to you and Ranking Member Cassidy for this hearing. To our witnesses, thank you all, not only for being here, but for the very important work that you do. Uh, Dr. Swan, I want to start with a question to you, just taking a step back. A lack of affordable dental options can result in patients skipping visits to the dentist, which can ultimately lead to even more expensive long-term health care challenges. So what is the impact on a patient's long-term oral health when they skip regular visits to the dentist? Well, we see that actually from COVID. Uh, the, the problem exacerbates, it just gets worse. And so therefore, the amount of money that's gonna take to save a tooth is gonna quadruple, yeah. or it's gonna end up with an extraction, which has been the solution for a lot of people, just take it out, because yeah. I have 28 or 32 of them. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. So worse, worse oral health, more expensive remediation once they do come to the doctor. And not just worse, worse oral, oral health. health, but systemic health. That's right, right. okay. Um, so Dr. Minter Jordan, some employers don't offer dental benefits and Medicare and Medicaid often provide little to no dental coverage for adults. As a result, nearly 70 million adults in the United States don't have dental coverage. Many families who have health insurers through their employers want to purchase standalone dental coverage through their state's insurance marketplace. Mm -hmm. However, while this is possible with some state-run marketplaces, depending on the design that the state mm -hmm. uh, decided to use, families can't purchase standalone dental coverage in New Hampshire and the 31 other states that use the healthcare.gov federal marketplace. So understanding that the dental programs that are on the marketplace are vetted and people can actually compare what what coverage is actually there, mm -hmm. what would 
B, the impact of allowing adults in New Hampshire and 31 other states to enroll in standalone dental plans on healthcare.gov. Thank you, Senator Hassan, for the question. Uh, it is clear that when people have access to dental coverage, they use it. And so what we would expect from that increased access through the marketplace and the ability for individuals and families to purchase it through the marketplace is increased access to care, increased access to prevention, and reduction in overall health care costs, given the correlation between oral health and overall health. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I have a bill with Senator Marshall called the Increasing Access to Dental Insurance Act. It has eight bipartisan co-sponsors, including Senator Braun, which would help fix this problem, allowing people across the country to access the vetted dental plans offered on healthcare.gov. And Mr. Chair, I know there's a markup next week that's focused on reauthorizations, but I would just urge us to see if we can fit this bill into an upcoming markup uh, because it's a straightforward way to improve coverage around the country. Um, lastly, I wanted to just build on what uh, Senator Murkowski was talking about. Um, last year, New Hampshire expanded Medicaid benefits to include dental coverage for adults. Um, however, I'm hearing as, you know, on a smaller scale, obviously, than Alaska, but New Hampshire has its rural places too, it is still really hard for people to find a dentist who takes Medicaid and is seeing new patients, especially in rural areas of New Hampshire. So, Dr. Simon, building on what the conversation you all just were having with Dr. Mur with Sarah Murkowski, what can we do to help dentists practice in places where they are most needed? So, as many people have said, of course, Medicaid reimbursement is a big, important issue for dentists trying to care for Medicaid patients. But across the country, if you look at the rates of Medicaid reimbursement in different states, it is not correlated with the number of dentists who accept Medicaid. So I would argue there's also something else going on. Providing more funding is always great, but there has to be a culture shift as well. Um, to a certain extent, rural dentists are graying. Uh, there are actually decreased rates of rural dentists because dentists in my generation are less likely to practice there. Um, I think the DHAP model is an amazing one that has shown that listening to communities and letting them lead the way is absolutely how we should be providing health care. Um, and we know that this can work in the lower 48 for uh, sovereign tribal communities, but also for Americans all over the place. We also know that for private practice dentists who choose to work in these areas, employing a dental therapist can increase their bottom line and allow them to care for more Medicaid beneficiaries. So I think it's a very amazing free market solution to this problem. On top of that, I would argue that having better infrastructure in our community health centers and recruiting more dental students from rural areas, um, as the West Virginia has done, um, does show that it could make a small dent in making these communities better served. Well, thank you very much for that. I, I have talked to dentists in New Hampshire who are graying and want to retire, but they don't know who's going to uh, follow in their practice, so they're keeping at it because they care about their patients. But at some point, we have to find better ways to solve this problem. So I thank you all for your work, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Isabel, in your professional opinion, what do you think are the driving causes of skyrocketing health uh, dental care costs in this country? What do you, in your opinion, <coughs> what's, what's driving that? You know, it's, it's workforce, uh, Senator. It's, you know, the the cost of competition, you know, we'll, we'll train somebody and then they're bought down the street from somebody else and, and just really keeping individuals in our practice because we want quality health care. And the, the, really the cost of supplies, equipment, even at the basic level to have, because our patients deserve quality care at all levels. And so the cost of doing business today is, uh, tremendously different than it used to be, where reimbursement levels uh, are very different um, in, in our world today. Um, so it, it's challenging to be able to, um, to, to make it work today to take care of our patients. And our patients deserve quality. So we sit down with every patient, spend time, we teach our patients. We believe so much in oral health literacy and teaching patients from the bottom level, getting involved in the schools and um, in, in every state. And I think it's important that we really educate people the need for oral health care. And I think all the panelists will uh, side with that. Uh, I think it's, but the cost of, of doing business has gone up tremendously, especially since COVID. Uh, it's really made it challenging for practitioners to be able to, but we want to do what's best for our patients. It's all about the patients always it's all and to me too it's about educating kids at a younger age <clears throat> absolutely you know I, I educated 100 
30 kids a year, you know, from all from all areas. And it's shocking to me, some kids that came from really no household that had very little money, but they had perfect teeth. A lot of it's hereditary. It's got to be because they had nothing. They had no clue what a dentist was. Uh, but then you have other people come in. It's just totally different. And of course, a lot of that has to do with our our diet. You know. Uh, so, what can we do on the federal level to incentivize more people to get in the dentist business and uh, hygiene business? I mean, I think it comes down to communication. I think it, it comes down to the educational process and giving people the opportunity. But I think it comes to actually teaching at an early level that the importance of, of dental care and then it's a profession that they can be proud of what they do. They get to work with patients every day. And it's fulfilling what we do. Like the story I told earlier of the young lady going to nursing school with all of her front teeth that came out and we built veneers and gave her a smile. The man that was in my office on Monday, I practice dentistry every day and the man was in there 20 years, he hadn't been since COVID, walked in, he just, and he came and got his teeth cleaned and um, about our vintage and he, 20 years ago, came in with his teeth rotted out. He said, what can I do? We rebuilt his mouth 20 years ago, and he said, it's been fantastic for 20 years. He said, my family's love it. He said, I still feel good about my smile. I feel good about who I am. And thank you so much for, yes, he's got some periodontal issues because that's partly genetic. That's partly, he's 70 years old like I am. Um, and that happens with time and age. Well, as, but, you, know, as you know, Nobody likes to go to the dentist, though. I'll no, be honest sir. with you, I'm I'm too much late on my my next cleaning, and I get a call every day. But uh, <laughs> yes, sir. That, that that's just part of it. But uh, Doc Swan, what do you think? What do we need to do federally to get more dentists? Have more dentists? Uh, I know it costs a fortune now in our universities that are going up 800 percent in terms of tuition cost uh, in the last 10 years. It's ridiculous. But uh, what do we need to do to get more people involved? I think the younger generation responds to social media, and uh, there are ways in which you can start educating people, as Dr. Harris said, to be able to catch them at an earlier age, to talk about the pros and cons of being in this profession. We also need to make sure that we are training in more of an interdisciplinary way. We need to work on our patients as a team so that every entity of healthcare is actually promoting optimal health. We also need to think about the business of dentistry as well as our patients' care. And sometimes they are interwoven, sometimes they're separate. We need to bring that together. The majority of dentists in America are general dentists, but 90% uh, or more is private practices. That's fine, but it needs to be a win-win situation. If you took the state of Massachusetts that has 7,000 dentists, if, one of, if each one of those just said, I will see five mass health patients a year, just to say, I'll do it. That would mean that everybody, along with the uh, FQHCs, would have a dental home. And then if you cross-train in medical schools, nursing schools, and pharmacy schools about all the systemic illnesses that come out of oral health, most medical nursing schools don't do anything around oral health. We are trained in silos. That's archaic. So there has to be a shift towards inclusion and being able to make sure that as healthcare, that we're all given the same message, that it's accurate, it's research proven, and we're actually educating our patients about preventing dental disease, which most of it can be prevented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hickman, move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, you know, I had the, the funny experience of seeing kind of a full circle. Uh, 52 years ago, I helped a, a, a kind of wild, uh, rebellious young man named Mark Vaselli start a community health center in Middletown, Connecticut called the Community Health Center, Inc. And he started it with a single dentist. And he had one afternoon a week, people could come in and get their, their teeth done from the, from the low-income communities around uh, North Main Street in Middletown, Connecticut. And then he got two afternoons a week. Um, now he's got 220 locations, I think. Uh, uh, but they don't have dental care everywhere. In other words, he's, that pendulum swang, uh, sw swang? Swang. <laughs> <coughs> Let's stick to, we'll stick to de dentistry here. Um, uh, it, it's come around full circle so that obviously we're not getting the uh, appropriate level of, of, uh, of dental hygiene to our entire country. 
Um, so, Dr. Simon, how can we share best practices of what we've seen in health centers um, to improve the integration of dental care with primary care and, and expand access for patients? I think we have a model for that, which is the many large consolidated health systems that provide the bulk of medical care in our country. Uh, they employ vast numbers of healthcare providers, but very rarely have dental providers as part of that mix. Even though they are receiving subsidies that are related to oral health care, for example, for all of the emergency department visits, where, uh, by the way, Senator Cassidy, you can't get a tooth extracted. Uh, the emergency department can't even do that for you for the most part. I got a friend that does it, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I wish all EDs had that, but most of them don't. So I think we have a lot of work to do of using existing health infrastructure in a more efficient way. If we could build a clinic into every hospital, that's one less location people have to go to to get their dental care. And I would note that while there are amazing private practice physicians like Dr. Isbell, the younger generation of dentists is more interested and more likely to work in different locations. And I think a lot of young dentists would jump at the chance to work alongside their medical colleagues in a setting like that. No, I think you're exactly right. And I think it is, it should be, a, a, we should have a sense of urgency about this. Uh, more than what we see. Um, and again, uh, you know, Mr. Maselli was a com community organizer is how he got into this, but he was constantly uh, bringing together persuasive arguments about this. And one of the things I remember vividly, 40 years ago at least, um, and, and, and Dr. Minner Jordan, maybe I'll ask you as well, they saw and heard alarming stories of kids from disadvantaged backgrounds who had real self-image problems having to do with their dental hygiene uh, and, and felt they didn't want to go to school. They, they you know, didn't feel comfortable in the neighborhood. Um, is there research on that that demonstrates that what a, how valuable that is? There is research that, and, and Senator Hickenlooper, thank you so much for raising the, um, the very real fact that there are so many children who go without oral health disease prevention. And therefore, and, and I shared this story in our opening, um, young children as young as three years old need to be put under anesthesia in order to fix some of those cavities that cannot be fixed in a dental chair. Um, they certainly impacts their ability to uh, participate in their education, to feel, to have you know, self-esteem, and then as they become adults, to be able to seek employment. And so happy to share additional information with your office on this important topic, um, just underscoring the, the real need for prevention and for education. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, last question, uh, the, the, and you've talked some, all of you have talked uh, about the dental workforce shortage um, and, and, and what that means. I think Colorado's been working very hard to lead in this effort to you know, educate the next generation of dental hygiene professionals. We've got Community College of Denver and the Front Range Community College, the Colorado Mountain College, Posh Peak Community College. I can go down the list of uh, all these uh, institutions that have committed to expand their programs by 2025 because we're asking them. We're, we're, we're reaching out and, and providing some funding. Um, this is going to certainly help <coughs> expand the workforce capacity, especially in diverse and underserved communities. But I'd let each of you, and I can just do this quickly because I've only got 38 seconds. Uh, you know, what else can we do to help foster the growth of, of dental support professional programs like the ones we we're talking about in Colorado um, at, more, at more schools, at more training programs, more states? People have to believe that they can be in this field. If they don't see anyone that looks like them or they don't, aren't able to visit a dentist themselves, then they won't be able to. When I was in dental school, I was one of the very few people there that didn't have a parent who was a dentist. If that's the only way you can enter this field, we are not going to do a good job of diversifying it. I would quickly add, we need to continue to remove the siloing between um, dental, dental oral health and medical health and ensure that we're cross-training and create the idea of interdisciplinary teams that are focused on the patient and their families. We need to incentivize people from underserved communities to actually go in to get the training who are culturally sensitive and return to those communities. Exactly. We are doing that in Alabama. We're trying to develop programs where students that are in high school from rural areas it's really hard for this, even with the social media, as Dr. Swan's mentioned, to get students, once they've gone to Birmingham or Atlanta or Nashville uh, to dental school, they've got student debt, to get them to go back. We have probably six counties in Alabama that, you know, there's some of my guys that are still there, but there's not any young dentists there. So really get them there. So really giving opportunities from the financial base of it, of them going to school with contracts understanding, they understand what dentistry means and why it's so important to the patients because those patients in those areas deserve quality care. Right. 
it's really important. And then open access to when they're in our hospitals, like I'm, I'm serving on two hospital staffs for 43 years, but guess what, all the dental equipment's gone, it's dead, all my Down syndrome, all my special need, all my nursing home patients, guess what? There's not an OR that I can go into for those very apprehensive, for those very severe. I have a daughter that lives in an electric wheelchair that has SMA. I understand disabilities, I understand barriers. So we bring stretchers into our office in Gaz and Alabama with ambulances, bring them to us to take care of those people who deserve care. But some of those people, it would be really great if we worked across medical borders and we had an opportunity to seal, whether one Friday a month or whatever to see those patients. General dentists are doing that. General dentists have done that for 50 years, and general dentists can do that in your state and mine, but that's not happening anymore. But, but we've got to educate young people the importance of high grade profession. Dentistry is a wonderful profession. I think everybody. No, we've got. We, I don't want to. The, the chair is going to come down on me. Uh, I'm already two minutes over. But anyway, I think this the is one hearing. of our best panels. Okay. Good. Thanks, Senator Hickelberg. Oh, Senator King. Thanks, Chair Sanders, and thanks to the panel. Dr. Swan, I want to talk to you about a part of the world that you and I both love. You're from Appalachian, Tennessee, and I appreciate your continued dedication to the region. Um, I'm going to be in uh, Appalachian, Virginia tomorrow visiting the Allegheny Highlands Dental Center, um, a dental center that serves folks in Appalachia that we were able to receive a significant congressionally directed expenditure to help them. But in particular, I want to thank you for your work on remote access medical. So just to paint the picture for my colleagues and those who are here, remote access medical does dental clinics and other medical clinics in remote areas. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first uh, sites that, and continuous sites, annual sites for RAM is the Virginia-Kentucky Fairgrounds in Wise County, Virginia. And beginning when I was lieutenant governor, I, would, I will often go to volunteer on this three-day weekend of service. And what happens is people start arriving about Tuesday or Wednesday to park their car in a dusty county fairgrounds parking lot to get a number so that when it opens Friday morning, they can go in and get medical care. Um, the first time I came, I was struck when I walked through the parking lot. I would have expected to see vehicles from Virginia and Kentucky and Tennessee and West Virginia and North Carolina. But I was surprised to see vehicles with license plates from Georgia and Florida and Alabama and even Oklahoma because people, low-income people at that point, beginning in 2002, 2003, had to drive that far to get medical care. The clinic is, uh, offers all kinds of medical care, but by far the most significant usage of the clinic are folks who are seeking dental care. Um, and the most significant thing is teeth extraction. If you just look at the bucket where the teeth are extracted at the end of each day, I mean, it's just staggering the number of people mm -hmm. who have to drive state through state through state just to have that happen. The numbers of people going to the RAM clinic declined when Virginia embraced Medicare expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, Medicaid expansion, excuse me, that was positive. But because it's a border community and many of the surrounding states haven't done Medicaid expansion, there's still a lot of folks. Right. But the numbers didn't decline on the people coming to seek mm -hmm. dental care. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, dental care not being uh, part of the essential health benefits yet. Um, and Virginia has embraced in 2022 a Medicaid expansion for dental care, and Virginia has also done a salary supplement under Medicaid for those who are serving, and yet still only 27% of our dentists accept Medicaid patients. So it's clear that we have an awful lot to do. Medicaid expansion has really helped the folks who came to that mm -hmm. clinic and come every year. But on the dental side, we need more operations like the Allegheny Highland Center that I'm going to tomorrow and others. And I just ap appreciate the role that RAM has played in this safety net. You know, it's kind of RAM is at the first rung of the safety net and then mm -hmm. free clinics and community health centers. And, but, but in the you know, nation that's probably the most powerful and wealthiest nation on the world, the fact that you'd have to drive through three or four states and park in a dusty parking lot and wait three days to get in line so you can have your teeth pulled. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was a missionary in Honduras when it was one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere next to Haiti. You know, this yeah. was in 1980 and 81, and it's not that different from what you might see in the dusty parking lot in Wise County, Virginia, yeah. which is the area of the state that my wife is from. Um, you said something, Dr. Simon, I wanted to follow up with you on, which is, it's not just reimbursement, there's a cultural thing. Because you're right, if, if Virginia, we embraced Medicaid uh, for dental services, we expanded it, and then the legislature put more, more money into increased reimbursement rates, and that's showing some 
success, but we still only have 27% of our dentists that accept Medicaid patients. You know, how do you view this cultural shift, any of you, and what, what might we do in addition to reimbursement increases to try to change that? I like the, who, who said if we can just get each, you know, dentist to take five Medicaid patients, right? And then that plus the safety net would help, but what can we do? I'd also point out that the 27% number doesn't even paint the whole picture because only 5% of Virginia dentists see more than 100 Medicaid patients a year. Yeah. So you have an extraordinarily small workforce who's really doing the work. 100 Medicaid patients is not very many when the average dentist has a patient panel of 1,500 plus patients. Mm -hmm. So really, it's, it's an incredibly small group. So I think understanding from that group themselves how they're able to do that. I would imagine many of them work in community health centers or other settings where they have sort of more infrastructural support in order to provide this amazing care. Um, but understanding the dentists who are able to do it is probably the first thing. The other thing, more big picture, would be to m make a shift between fee-for-service to a value-based care yeah. model. Right. right now, dentists feel like they're not getting enough money for each procedure they do. But patients would benefit if they didn't need any procedures. And dentists make nothing if that's the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a model that aligns patient and provider perspectives and lets dentists actually practice in a way that's more meaningful and preventive focused, I think, is also uh, a Other nations part of do that. that, and they have much better health, com health outcomes than we do. Any others that might want to comment on this issue about the culture shift, if my chair would enable me now that I'm over time to hear the answer? Well, part of the culture shift is to shift more towards prevention. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But to be able to teach people how to prevent disease and what and how disease are interacting with one another really requires increasing health IQ, and it means that you have to do it in a culturally sensitive way, even in Appalachia. That's a culture, and you have to be able to use that as a way to be able to educate people about prevention. If we don't do that, we're never gonna be able to fix and put Band-Aids on all these situations. Dr. Minnerchorn. I certainly would agree with everything that's been said. The focus on prevention and increasing and leveraging the use of ancillary providers within dental practices so that the dentist is focused on working at the top of their licensure and aided by uh, ancillary providers in the office that helps provide more access to Medicaid patients. And then Dr. Isbell. Yeah, you know, I, I think it comes down to education, Senator. I think it's about treating every patient that we can. I mean, there's in, in a practice like he's had and I have, there's there's only so many patients you can see. We treat, we, one of my associates treats the patients in the jail. Who wants to go do that? I mean, you, if you were dentist, you're, you're not gonna wanna do that. But guess what, they deserve care. How about our nursing home patients? We treat numerous nursing homes. We bring them in in stretchers into our office to take care of them. And, um, and many of our elder care, they're coming in in wheelchairs, but having it, the structure where it can be there. So it gets down to, how much can you do? Our children, we see so many of our children. We go into the grammar schools and teach oral health literacy to our children. And then we send brochures home to try to get to the parents. How do you get to the parents? Because guess what? They weren't raised with that, Senator. And the, the parents don't understand. So it starts from the bottom level, teaching the child, teaching the parent, and every access that we can to give them an opportunity to, to understand what Dr. Swan has said if there's so many things that we do in dentistry that by education and getting on there with just simple prevention, we can save so much for, for every family and, for every, and prevent the catastrophic stories that we're all yeah. telling. Well, I appreciate your service, your testimony, and thanks, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Uh, I would be remiss, Dr. Swan, uh, not mentioning uh, Stan Brock. Uh, I met Stan. Well, you know, Stan is, Stan is the founder of RAM, I believe. And when you talk, uh, Senator Kane, about those, I, I remember seeing those photographs, and it really, you're quite right, did not look like this was taking place in America. Uh, and Stan did a great job, I think, in raising consciousness and providing care. Uh, with that, uh, Senator Cassidy, you want to introduce something into the record? Yeah, on behalf, on behalf, first I want to point out, Dr. Swan, did you notice that when Dr. Isbell said something earlier, like our vintage, and he nodded toward you, that he was uh, kind of roping you in. Well, he's probably age. younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not he's a lot me. better looking, too, but yeah. <laughs> no, not, not really, but I am not younger than you. <laughs> Class of 75, UCSF. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of Senator Paul, who could not be here today, I ask unanimous consent that this statement for the record from the American Dental Association be submitted into the record. Without objection. Uh, that ends our hearing, and I, I want to thank each of our panelists. This is an enormously important issue. You raise consciousness on it. I thank you all very much for the work uh, that you do personally and 
uh, in advocating the need for quality dental care for all. Uh, for any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record five statements in support of dental health. Committee stands adjourned. Thanks again.